Should all the spookles be forgot and doogly poogly spook? Should all the spookles be forgot and things I kick it, Shane McGowan? <laughs> This song rips. This makes me want to dance. This is exactly what I was expecting, and it did not disappoint. The song is Wildcat of Kilkenny. It's by the Pogues off their 1985 album, Rum, Sodomy, and the Lash. And I made this joke last week, but man, that's what happened to me last night on New Year's Eve. And it's also number 440 out of 500 on the Spotify original, The 500 with Josh Adam Myers. What's up, Fleece Army? You king kadoogles, you spoogles you doogles I love you guys happy new year 2020 we're ringing it in with one of the most fire records we've had on this list and I mean it I am grateful for each and every one of you kadoogles for joining me each week as we go through Rolling Stone Magazine's top 500 albums list from 500 down to one guys 2020 is going to be an incredible year for the 500. We have so many incredible guests coming up and so many incredible records. I've never been this excited about anything in my life. I just want to say I'm grateful for Spotify coming in and, and joining the mix and helping us get this word out. I love working with Spotify. I want to give thanks to Jeremiah Avery Morty. Fucking Morty, the man, the myth. Adam, who else? Fucking, oh, Peter. Yeah, I can't forget about Peter. I love you guys, and I love each and everybody that's in the Fleece Army, guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 2020, man. 2020, man and woman. All right, let's find out about this record. Released on the 5th of August, 1985, and produced by Elvis Costello, with one track produced by Philip Chevron, this is the second album by London-based Celtic folk punk rock band The Pogues. Here's how this mix of English and Irish musicians playing traditional and modern instruments came together. Singer Shane McGowan was already in a punk band, The Nipple Erectors, or The Nips, that's what some people call them, when he met tin whistle player and vocalist Spider Stacy in the bathroom at a Ramones gig in London in 1977. While still in The Nips, McGowan joined Stacy's and banjo player Jem Finer's part-time Irish folk pub band, The Millwall Chainsaws. After The Nips broke up in 1980, McGowan devoted more time to The Millwall Chainsaws, and in 82, they added former Nips guitarist James Fernley to start a new band with the name Pogue Mahone, which is Irish slang for Kiss My Arse. Kiss my arse, you Pogue Malone. Pogue, M- P- not Malone, it's Mahone. Pogue Mahone, built on the same foundation of punk-infused Irish traditional music as the Millwall Chainsaws. As Spider Stacy said, we'd pick up instruments and couldn't play and do Irish folk songs at 140 miles an hour, playing them badly, but with spirit. They later added Caitlin O'Rourdon on bass and vocals and drummer Andrew Rankin. In 1984, they got a lot of attention after opening for The Clash, and that same year, they signed to Stiff Records, changed their name to The Pogues, and released their debut album. Their mix of traditional Irish music played with punk energy and McGowan's gutter hymn ballads received positive reviews. The next year, they got Elvis Costello to produce Rum, Sonomy, and The Lash, their second album, and added Philip Chevron on guitar and mandolin. With a mix of traditional songs and originals, many of them centered around themes of war and the military, the album was also well-received, and the first two singles were the Pogues' first to enter the UK Top 100. The band put out five more studio albums, an EP, and live albums with several lineup changes before breaking up and then regrouping. But this record really started their career and is still considered one of their best. Our guest today is one of the original members of this band. From the Pogues, it's James Fernley. I couldn't be more excited for you guys to hear this episode. Not only is James one of the founding members of the Pogues who originated the Celtic punk sound, but he's got a new band called the Walker Rotors, who comprise of members from both the Dropkick Murphys and Flogging Molly. Also, James wrote an incredible book about the story of the Pogues called Here Comes Everybody, 
the story of the Pogues, and you can get it on Amazon. It was a gift to be able to sit down with this dude. Rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe to The 500. Listen free on Spotify or anywhere you get your pods. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com. And for all things 500, go to our website, the500podcast.com. Well, guys, nothing left to say, but here we go with number 440 out of 500 with rum, sodomy, and the lash by the Pogues. <laughs> James Farley, James Farley, James Farley, James Farley, James Farley, and a James and a James and a James and a James, a James, a James, a James. What is that tune? That's a, a pair of a pair of brown eyes. You win the. You I've got a pair thing. of hazel eyes. I think, so actually. do I. All right, fine. We're both we just two gorgeously eyed uh, men. We just from Los Angeles. So. Anyway. So, so I've got to say this because usually I ask each guest uh, when they first got introduced to the artist and the record, but this is a very special episode of the 500 because we actually have one of the founding members of the the band on the podcast. Well, there might be some disagreement about that. All right, can we get a new guest? <laughs> well, all right, so I read about how you had previously played guitar with Shane, but then yeah. you took off time to write a novel. And That's then, right. And then one day, Jem Finer, I think her name is? His, yeah. His name, I'm sorry, thank yeah. you. Your your precious banjo player shows up with an accordion in a laundry bag. That's right. Because he and Shane wanted you to play in their band. Yeah. So, and so, at the same time, so Shane was in a band with Spider, Stacy, who became the Pogues whistle player. And uh, Shane and Spider were in a band called the Millwall Chainsaws. Then they would do, oh no, did they call themselves something else? It might have been um, the New Republicans, okay. they were called. Uh, and the pun was, they, they were the publicans from Newry. And Newry is a town in Northern Ireland. So, but it read as, it sounded like New Republicans, but it's actually Newry. Republicans, oh, like we that. get that subtle uh, in the polls and everything. Or Shane gets that subtle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they were doing um, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, Republican songs um, uh, around the place. Jem, and so, so they're doing Republican songs. So is it like, oh Reaganomics, here we come, Reaganomics, trickle down effect. You don't know how close you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck the poor people, <laughs> fuck the poor people, more for the rich. Am I close? No. <laughs> and um, so they were doing um, gigs, um, Spider and Shane in the Millwall Chainsaws, Chainsaws and the, um, the the New Republicans. And Jem and Shane, in the meantime, were busking around town. They, they uh, uh, auditioned for a spot at uh, Covent Garden um, to, and, and failed it. Um, but then went off to go and play in Finsbury Park Tube Station and stuff with um, both of them playing guitar. And then there was the, then the iteration of the group at that time was myself and Shane and Jem at Shane's flat in uh, King's Cross. So it's like these three sort of um, formations of the band sort of gradually came together um, until Shane uh, invited Cot O'Riordan. Her name looks like Kate, mm -hmm. but it's actually pronounced Cot. Um, uh, and a drummer called John Hasler, who used to drum in uh, Madness at one time, and his brother was in Madness as a as a singer. Um, um, so that was the that was the original sort of iteration of the band with six people in it. But it really kicked off when we got caught in the in the band to, uh, and John Hasler as well. So it was like a proper band instead of just like two people over here and three people over here and another two over over there. So, so like from that, how did this record come about then? Like well, um, we, uh, how far back do you want to go? Because it's, take it. it's no, alive. this is all. I mean, this is this is this is your show. I, I'm so interested to find out anything. I, I, I love this album. So, just so everybody knows, our album is number four forty out of five hundred. It's the second studio album, Rum, Sodomy, and the Lash by the Pogues, released August fifth, nineteen eighty five. Produced. 
by the great Elvis Costello. Mm-hmm. So, so tell me about. So you've already had one record come out before yeah. this. So get us get us up to this record. Like how did? All right. Did, so did, so the first record was called um, um, Red Roses for me, um, and and I'm not saying that that because Elvis Costello was was interested. He was interested on, on in two prongs actually. One of them was a musical prong, and the other one was um, eventually marital because he married Cot. Um, he invited us out on the road with him in 1984. We went uh, to up and down England and then to Ireland, which was fun. Um, difficult as well because we just crashed through our half an hour set and tried to get through to the end without um, completely, you know, ending up in chaos. Um, Were a lot of the shows like that? um, From listening to this music, I can only imagine what the live show would be like. um, Well, we got better at live shows. We were shit at live shows to begin with, but it was live shows that made us happen because we... Uh, most of us lived in a place called Hillview Estate um, off of Grays Inn Road in London, just out near King's Cross. So we kind of more or less had our, we housed our own audience until, well, we didn't house them. We just <laughs> happened to be living Release there. Release the hounds. We have, we have but to it was kind of like that. We have, to, we have to open for the because stones it, tonight. They sort, of, they sort of drained from Hillview Estate into yeah. the Pinder of Wakefield, which is the pub at the end of Cromer Street, which is Shane's. Uh, uh, is that go to pub? Um, yeah, kind of, sort of. We used to uh, do our office business in the Pinder of Wakefield. It was, uh, it's been a, a folk club for a long time. You and McCall played there, and uh, back in the day, oh, and tons of other people. And now it's a, 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 a Victorian musical place mm-hmm. uh, called the Water Rats. But it's got a long, a long history. So, and it was just next door to the Hillview Estate. So basically, we yeah, we we drained Hillview Estate into the um, into the Pinder of Wakefield over a f- few weeks. So we had a residency there, um, uh, and the, the 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 initial gigs were fairly chaotic. We didn't have the slightest idea about a set list, so we just sort of discussed what song we were going to do next, and it ended so up So you with, just look at each other and go, what do, you, what do you guys feel like playing? And it was just well, off it to wasn't the quite Well, it wasn't quite as nice as that. I mean, there what was... The fuck you want to play? That's, well, is that good impression? No. That's terrible. Well, do you, well, know what well we doing. can work on that in the course <laughs> of, the, um, of, the, of, the, of the podcast. <laughs> but um, no, there was glasses kicked around once and, and, and shouting and, and um, all that kind of stuff until somebody said, well, write a fucking set list down and then you don't have to have all this shit going on on stage. Yeah. But uh, I guess it was fun as well. Um, and then we got the live thing down after a, after a while and, and I think it would probably ended up being one of the best live acts that, well, no, you can't say that. We were, we were, we're a good live act. And it was uh, when I'd left the group in 1993 to come and live here, I got replaced by um, uh, another guy. And then I went to go and see, <laughs> go and see my band that I was in. And it was great to watch all these guys come out on stage. And it was like them closing off a street. And there was something really threatening about all these guys, just like in a, in a line across all with folk instruments. It was kind of chilling. So I'm glad that they... St- well, I'm glad that that's what I th- think that we presented whenever we came out on, on stage. Sure. Um, it was fun to, to be able to just command a fucking room like that. Before we get into this week's episode, let's talk a little bit about Sonos for the holidays. If you're wondering what to get your friends and family for the holidays or you just want to have that holiday party blowing up kashplukid, the brilliant sound of Sonos is the answer for you. Play all your favorite holiday jams with a new home theater system. I put Sonos into my life about a year and a, a little, little under a year ago, and it's made everything better. I have speakers in every room. I've got the subwoofer, so does that woof. I've got the Sonos Move, which is incredible because you can move the speaker wherever you want and it sounds better than every other portable speaker on the market. It's insane. The clarity, the bass, I love it. Plus, they've got speech enhancement mode. It's a new, unique feature that clarifies the sound of the human voice. Perfect for when characters whisper on television or if the action intensifies. Turn it on in the Sonos app and never miss a moment of the story. Or play all your favorite holiday jams when the TV is off. And guess what? 
Sonos works with Spotify and all the other streaming services. And you can also wirelessly connect all your speakers to create your perfect sound system. It's the perfect gift. The gift of crystal clear sound. Go to Sonos.com to complete your holiday shopping. And now, back to the gushblooky. Was Shane just writing songs or was this a collaborative effort to to come up with Rum Sodomy and the Lash? Like how did it how did it get started? Was it just we got to make a new album, let's jump oh, in. Oh, all right. So, uh, no, um because when I first met with Shane and Jem, I mean, I've I've, met, I've known them bef- before, but when I when I first met them in in a when musical you, setting. But in, when did you meet Shane though? Like how long ago was that? Well, I went off uh, that was 19 the summer of 1980 that I um was in a band. I'd been in bands and this band that I was in was just folding up. So I answered um, uh, 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 an advert in the Melody Maker, which is how you got um, how you f- auditions yeah, and stuff like that. So through the Melody Maker, here's an advert that says, uh, name band wants a guitar player. So I rang up and I didn't ask what the name of the band was. Uh, I forgot. And turned up at this rehearsal space in North London on Holloway Road. Um, and I'd, and I, when I walked in, I recognised Shane from um, sort of NME, uh, new music paper Oh, I know articles. NME, yeah. But I'm obsessed with British music, so I, I, yeah. I know about the Mercury Music Prize, I know about MME, NME. Yeah. Uh, so you answer that, you meet up with him, and you were saying? Um, so, um, and so I recognised who he was and felt a little bit disappointed that I was in an audition for this guy, because at that time he was called <laughs> Shane O'Hooligan and he was only famous for having his ear bitten off by one of the Moldettes at a Clash gig. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, fine. But, um, but it was f- the audition was fun and he was with Sean um, Bradley, who was the, basically the love of his life then. And maybe he has a holds a bit of a torch for sure. her still, because um, he wrote a song, uh, an instrumental called "Sham Bradley" for the album after Rum Sodom in the Lash. Um, so, uh, but they've been very fond and very close with one another for a long time. But they were like the the creative pair in the room. There was a drummer um, who was the fifth drummer that um, they'd had, and I was auditioning as the tenth guitarist. So. I didn't expect to last very long. <laughs> the 10th. Just, yeah, just go over there in the in the guitar section. We've got a woodwind section showing up. I, I just think that is hysterical. Of course. So, fuck it. I've, 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 Shane came up to me in the audition and he said, uh, can you do um, uh, disconnected shards of industrial noise? So I said, <laughs> yeah, I can do them. <laughs> so I had a go at doing in, uh, disconnected shards of industrial noise. And I think that's maybe what got me the uh, the gig in, oh, the, um, in the band. <laughs> So I hung out with him that night and went off drinking and we just traded stories from our families and stuff, um, got on really well. Ended up going back to his house where I stayed in Jem Finer's room at this squat that they were staying in. Yeah. Um, so that's how I that's how I met Shane through an audition. Oh, that's great! All right, yeah. so 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 like mm. we were saying, back to this album though. Yeah. So so how, so like how did the writing process start for this record? Because this this album is, you know, like th- this is what I could say. The, the first thing I have to say about listening to this record is that Shane is a genius as far as lyrics. I, I, I was just so blown away mm. by how great of a storyteller he was. And not only is he cleverly telling these stories, but he's also using sometimes true poetic wordplay, mm-hmm. you know? And, and whether it's as honest as anyone has ever been or literally hilarious, I think you can put Shane up there with like Dylan and Springsteen as far as genius songwriting storytellers. But I also think you could put him up there with Yeats and George Bernard Shaw mm-hmm. for Irish writers. I read the lyrics, I listen to the music, and I'm and I'm just completely immersed in what this guy is saying. Mm-hmm. This isn't an album that I can listen to all the time. You know what I mean? It's like, for me, it was... So you're saying it's not? Well, no, no, no. I'm saying that I'm not... This isn't something I'm yeah. just chilling. I can't... Because it's, it, it creates No, no, it doesn't engage. It, it, it doesn't engage, yeah, it, 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 yeah. it, 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 yeah. it tickles something in me that makes me want to move when mm. I was so I put it on when I'm driving I found you know when I'm really on the highway it was fantastic mm. but it's like there's there's so many levels to this there, this is a combination of, of punk of Irish Celtic music of of country western mm-hmm. I've heard so many different there's ballads there's punk rock songs there's everything and it just creates this energy that on so far on this list out of the 60 records we've done I don't know if I felt anything like this so far I was just completely blown away well you're only into 60 have you got another four I know I get, I'm getting, but this go. is but this is what I'm saying it's like this <laughs> album could be higher on the list well but, we did we did sort of um, contribute to, to the musical 
tradition, really. Sure. I, I think we turn mu- Irish music on its ear a bit, and maybe we turn punk music on its ear a bit too. Oh, at the 100%. same time, you know. Yeah. So, so did you know while when you're getting started to make this record that you were making such a game changer no, of an I album? No, I didn't. No, Not I was just all. I was just trying to learn how to play the fucking accordion. Is what I was trying to do. <laughs> how? Seriously, how? How? What do I mean? Like how? Like how do you I, play well, the accordion? What, I, I mean, I think I can dick around in the fuck. It's just you fucking. Push That's the all things, I do is dick around the, on the accordion. You push the thing. You do a little squiggly do, and you fucking. <laughs> right. Well, that's I've been getting away with this for fucking thirty years now, thirty-five years, <laughs> and and I I, I I used to bother. I used to bother with the left hand, with all the buttons and everything. I know what they do. Yeah. But uh, I don't know how to get them to do what I want them to do. I've forgotten that. If if I even knew how to do it in the first place, it's a bit like the dark side of the moon over there. Yeah. Um. So I concentrate on the right hand. So I'm not a solo accordion player. I can't do weddings and, <laughs> and funerals. Really? Well, it that sucks. Cause I was actually, an accordion I, 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 funeral, my, a friend just sake. died three days ago, and then two days after that, I got my cousin get married, and I was gonna I was gonna bring you, but I guess not. I can't do it. I just no. Sorry, not me. I'm no. <laughs> I, I, if you give me six, eight, fifteen people to play with, I'm great. If you give me half of an accordion, I can play it. The other <laughs> half can go fuck itself. <laughs> so you're making the record. Was it a difficult process to really sit down to really just get everybody together? I mean, you, you talk about at the very spike. beginning. At the very beginning, it was because uh, Shane would slow puff now and again uh, and be late for stuff. And as he was with the um, with the Nips, the the band that I was played the guitar yes. uh, in, um, it was yeah, it was hard. And he would sometimes turn up drunk, and and you would think. Well, what do you talk to him about that or what's the point oh, hard um, and Spider would uh, slow puff as well uh, from time to time but it was Jem really who was the glue for, for all those rehearsals and he would go around and talk to Shane and say you know what if we're going to make a going of this you know we need to practice and he said that to Spider as well so we crammed into um, the back bedroom of this guy's house on Hillview Estate that I'd already mentioned uh, who, who donated his bedroom for us to rehearse in it was a tiny little room we were just crammed in there and we worked and worked and worked how and many, worked and worked how many people are in that six. room six people that's not too yeah. bad no it was but tiny it was, tiny. It, was, just, oh, it, was um, it was about the size of this room oh, but maybe was, a little bit longer that would suck no, it was, it was hard, but... Um, but, but, it, but it was fun, probably, as well. I mean... Um, yeah, but to get all the work done before closing time, I, I, I past 10 of them, we'd go down to the pub and, and we'd have two pints and come straight back up to the bedroom and then do some more. Um, um, yeah, we worked really, really hard listening to what we, we were trying to do and going over and over and over and over the stuff. It wasn't like just it came together and we were fucking great. Yeah. It was a lot, a lot of hours put in. Here, let's dive into the album. Let's get into yeah, it. Yeah, go on. So uh, the album opens uh, with the sickbed of Ku Cullen. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Before, thank, I heard you say it and I was like, just don't fuck. Because I would have called it Cuchiliani. <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I don't know like if you're one. from New Jersey. Yeah, I or mean, something. I'm, yeah, exactly. Hey, you do it. It's the sick <laughs> man of Kukuliachinani. Yeah, you do it. Peter, go ahead and play the first verse. McCormick and Richard Tauber are singing by the bed. There's a glass of punch below your feet and an angel at your head. So what I love about this is that this is the slow part of the song, but mm. then this is my and this is my intro into the Pogues. So this first thing starts, I was like, okay, right. okay, and then this shit kicks in, and and not just it, does it kick in, and like we said, this is like what you want to call what Celtic punk almost. Well, I've had a bit of a run in with Spider lately about Celtic punk and what it really is, and and. Oh, I I don't know because like I'm working uh, on a in a similar vein with my group now with Ted Hutt in it from Flogging Molly and yeah. Mark Oral from from Flogging uh, from from um, Dropkick Murphys, and and for convenience's sake I've just been calling it Celtic Punk. But then Spider came to me says stop calling it Celtic Punk because it's not Celtic Punk. I don't know what it is. It's I guess the Pogues genre is its own um, without being too smart ass about sure. it. Sure. Um, uh, and it's yeah, I think it's just a bit facile to call it Celtic punk, really. Um, it's just Celtic music 
played in a funky sort of <laughs> style. <laughs> I, what I like with Bill, Billy Bragg, when Billy Bragg said it, we took Irish music and threw it down the cellar steps, yeah. it's, uh, I think it was one of the best ways. Yes, of it. but what I loved about this song is is that is that like I said, this was it goes into one starts one way and then it goes into this full force just train ride, uh, and then you really get to hear. And I feel like this song highlights the genius of Shane's lyrics. I mean, it's incredible. Now, mm. besides uh, Cuculin, yeah. uh, who was an Irish mythological hero and leader similar to King Arthur that rose yeah. from his deathbed, this binge-drinking song is so densely filled with more references to Irish mythology, politics, history, humor, culture, and it even addresses the Irish diaspora, which is when natives of Ireland went to reside in other countries. So even though the Pogues are so identified by Irish history, traditions, mm. culture, and mythology, I was surprised to find out that only a couple of them were actually yeah. born in Ireland. Uh, well, like in fact, only... Well, once we'd added Terry Woods, who joins the band after, I think just when this record was released... Uh, so he was... I don't know where he was born in Ireland, but he's from Dublin, basically. He lives in County... Uh, County Cavern now, I think, or just no, maybe not. Anyway, uh, but but Teddy Waters has got a story in himself, in uh, in itself, uh, who he's played with, um, and and his contribution to the folk scene in England and in Ireland too, and in the states a little bit as well. Um, I've got no Irish associated with me at, at all, and the first time that actually that, that I went or that we went to uh, Belfast, yeah, um, I happened to be wearing a lumberjack shirt that was red, white, and blue. Oh. And then to go into, um, uh, oh, what's the name of the pub? It's right opposite the um, Europa, the most bombed hotel in Europe um, at the time. And then Shane said to me, you know, like, when you go in the pub, don't talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I kept my fucking coat closed over my fucking red and white you know basically union jack shirt yeah <laughs> oh god i was I, I i was a bit wet behind the ears i think really when it came to <laughs> irish politics and well were, was there pressure uh on you guys to remain like this symbol of pride for the country you no know? no um no uh and, and i think um shane got a lot of stick as well um i remember doing a video once and we had sort of extras in the room and uh i think we must have filmed it in ireland i guess because um I, we heard this woman saying it's it's, it's it's a disgrace to ireland you know wow um and and um you're like shut up mom all right i'm trying my best all right well we were trying our best we tried our best um a, a, a lot to to make sense out of what we were trying to do and 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 to learn how to do it um and as i say i spent and i wasn't joking when i said i spent most of the time learning how to play the accordion and to and to play irish tunes the way that I'd heard other people, Irish, you know, accordion players, play them as best I could, mm -hmm. uh, not having really touched an accordion before, um, and and we were we were deadly serious about what we were doing. I think, I think the sort of um, the core of everything was Shane, basically, who um, I think what triggered the whole thing. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but Spider came across him in a in a party where Shane was just thrashing rebel songs on an acoustic guitar and said, shit, you ought to do something with that. So that's basically where it came from, is just wow. one guy just thrashing away on an acoustic guitar singing rebel songs. And then it sort of unfolded from that into songs like Sick Better Coo Cullen and uh, The Old Main Drag and, and whatever the fuck else, The yeah. Pair of Brown Eyes. It's, um, it's, that, it, it's that sort of ground zero thing. What's so funny for me, because I just, after I've talked to so many people over the last week about the Pogues, I, I started saying that the Pogues are, represent Ireland more than fucking you too. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it has this feel. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm maybe surprised you've, that- Yeah, maybe you've got a point. And, I, and, and uh, you got a point in in, in a respect, yeah. Yeah, I, I it's, it's not that. a it's not a diss on either or. It's just yeah, like yeah. it's this it's this thing where I'm just like, no, this is this is something that the country is proud of. It was a little bit contentious, I think, 
going over to Dublin for the first time, and we were exploited a little bit by um, uh, a, a radio disc jockey called BP Fallon. Um, nice guy, genial, bit pixie-ish, you know, in the sense of, you know, like pixie-ish from the woodland sort of thing. Yeah. Um, um, a bit sort of self-parodying sort of guy, but he got a gig for RTE, the radio station in Dublin, to bring a, a kind of symposium together of traditional mus- uh, musicians or, or a couple of professional musicians, uh, uh, traditional musicians and uh, m- members of the public and then facing off against them, there was us. And it was, I think we were being accused of bringing calls to Newcastle, like here come London, a London band with hardly any Irish people in it. And Shane was brought up in Ireland. Uh, he wasn't born there, but he was brought up in County Tipperary until he was six. Um, so he he would know just as much about Irish culture as, as anybody that, that was born there. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was this face-off in this studio in RTE where um, particularly one traditional musician sort of lit into us saying that um, that what we were playing was an abortion and, and that I had no right to play this stuff at all. And even called the Dubliners an abortion and even called... Um, uh, uh, Planksty, I think, another yeah. massive um, uh, folk Irish band, um, because he was a concertina player who just played uh, single notation music with no uh, uh, harmonics or anything. It was just melody, which is, I, um, I understand, is like the be all and end all of proper, you know, traditional, traditional Irish music. Um, so it got a bit contentious, and we played up to that a little bit, and. Um, and then sold out a, a club the next day and nice. when it went fucking bonkers and, nice. and and a guy tried to steal our banjo player from the stage. <laughs> Just like, wrapped his arms around him and <laughs> tried to pull him off. <laughs> All right, let's go into the second song. Uh, you mentioned already the old man drag. Uh, this is a sad tale of a dying teenage male junkie who has resorted to prostitution and more on the mean streets of Piccadilly Circus, a bustling junction in London's West End, similar to Times Square in New York. You know, this is uh, this is the band just keeping it light. Uh, let's hear <laughs> how the night ended uh, at 2.42. Play the last verse, Peter. And now I am lying here. I have had so much booze. I've been spat on and shut on and raped and abused. Oh man, I, we've all had nights like that. Am I right, people? You know, a, a, that's just a, a dope Celtic twist, which is actually sounds like a really wild sex move. You ever had a girl give you the old dope Celtic twist? <laughs> no, and I dread the day that it happens. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I'm lying here. I've had too much booze. I've been spat on, shat on, raped, and abused. I mean, this is these are harsh images. And yet he's making them sound so beautiful. I mean, it yeah, and really... I was just thinking of, of the of the the, the backing music. Then, yeah, like the accordion is so sweet and floaty. Oh, and you're everything killing like that. it, dude! Fucking hell, you're James. But it seems so inappropriate <laughs> this, when you listen yeah. to the to the words. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck was I thinking? You playing that one <laughs> half of the accordion, dude? No, You've I was actually got... playing two halves what? in that one. I was. Oh shit! That was before I forgot how to how to work it. That's a dope Celtic twist. That's, That's a dope what Celtic. Which <laughs> gives you a two hand. So at the time in the newspaper. Papers, there was um, um, uh, fairly regular, but there was one story in particular. There was a kid found in a sort of subway. Um, I don't mean subway like the metro sort of thing, subway, but like an, under, an underground passageway that they are yeah. they have in, in London. Uh, found dead, you know, and, and he was only 16 and he'd come from North. And I think Shane was locking into that story somehow. Yeah. Which is a, a, a kind of a, a theme that Shane loiters around a lot of people who, who, who haven't had a chance. And, 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 and basically life has kicked him in the balls and... Yeah. and, and and a lot of them end up dead, you know. Like you just have to look around Hollywood right now. Uh, thinking, I mean, you know, yeah, it's it's that's why I feel this this mm. story is so. There's like there's a drag in Baltimore called the Block, mm. which uh, is just I, I could picture this happening, this whole story happening there. I mean, yeah. it was like there were strip clubs. There was, and then also I used to DJ at a strip club for years, mm. so I had seen these people come in and just spend all of their money and get wasted drunk and get taken advantage of yeah. by some of these girls, and I had seen girls get taken advantage of. I did see some funny stuff. I remember when the economy crashed in 2008, this one stripper came up to me. She's like, man, I've been giving out a lot of $5 specials, and I'm like, 
what's the five dollar <laughs> specials, Isis? And she goes, that's Isis. What, yeah, that's her name. I swear to God. She goes, five dollar specials where I eat a bag of hot chili Fritos and then I just breathe on his dick. I was like, God <laughs> Damn. All right. Well, a hard like Celtic so, twist, I would say. Uh, you yeah. had the dope Celtic twist. Now, a cool little fact about this song. Uh, it was used in the 1991 Gus Van Zandt film about <sighs> young gay prostitutes called My Own Private Idaho. That's right. With Keanu Reeves yeah. and River Phoenix, which uh, yeah. now it, it just makes perfect, perfect sense. <laughs> All right. Yeah. The next re- next song on the album is uh, one of my favorites on the record, The Wild Cats of Kilkenny. Kilkenny. Kilkenny, yeah. okay. It grabs you right from the beginning, but really picks up into a fun song. But it has this intense bass line part that yeah. I love so much. Uh, Peter, play Minute 50 in. Dude, I love this so because I was not expecting that no. bass line to come in, and then you get the shrieks, and it's great. And and I and I heard this, and I was like, at first, I was like, is this the music that Jack danced to in the poor section of the Titanic? And then I was then it, then that bass line comes in with all those yelps, and I was like, this is perfect, man. This is just uh, an instrumental song. I, mm. I love it. So the title is based on an old story about two cats from the small county town of Kilkenny, Ireland, that fought so hard that all they had left of them was their tails. Kilkenny cats have come to represent any tenacious fighter and have been informally adapted by some sports teams. And you took the tales you had been journaling for years and put it in your 2012 book, Here Comes Everybody, your autobiographical account of the history of the Pogues. Did any of the Pogues or, or your crew go all Kilkenny Cat on you over how they were portrayed in the book? Well, um, uh, it was uh, parts of it were contentious. Yeah. Um, I, I, at the end of a tour, we'd, we played a festival in, in London and, and I had the manuscripts printed up and I brought them to the gig uh, um, and handed them out so they could read the manuscript before it went to the printers and everything like that. I hadn't actually done proofreading or anything, but I'd finished the, the, the typescript. Um, and I handed um, one to Shane and he sort of weighed it in his hand and he said, um, and he says, is that all there is? <laughs> Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'd asked him before about, you know, I'd not asked him, I told him, oh, this is what I was doing. And he says that he couldn't give a fuck what I did. So, and he doesn't give a fuck, generally speaking, uh, 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 about that sort of thing. Um, but then there were phone calls that went to, uh, in the background a lot over the next couple of days. And, and uh, one of the bands said, you know, like, what have you done? Um, and... I, uh, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's just like a, it's a version. It's my version of what, of course, of, of what yeah. happened. And everybody else has got their own versions. In fact, um, th- th- there were bits in it where a, a girlfriend in, in the book said, well, it didn't happen that way, but I kind of like the way that you wrote about it because sure. it could have happened that way. Sure. So, um, um, and then somebody else came up to me after a gig and said, uh, my God, you've got balls of steel. <laughs> um <laughs> Um and uh, yeah, maybe. yeah, that woman sounded so weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, "You got balls, I steal." Is yeah. that me with a vagina? Because that's what it would sound like. <laughs> so, but so a lot of people. I mean, but you were just giving your account of of what it is. I mean, that's like if yeah, it's the, true, it's true. It's just like I said, people have different versions. They see things in their so eyes, they do. But then it's still at the things. bottom of it. It's like, well, why write a book in the fucking first place? Because you have to tell that story. You have to. You're, it's like you I, said. Guess, I guess. I guess you do because uh, I. I. I, yeah, your... I could write it in a fucking diary and then just read it some day later and and think, oh, oh, poor boy, you know, he had that experience. Oh, that was great. Remember that? And it's just between me and myself. Yeah. Um, but then I had something in my mind as well um, uh, that my dad. My dad always asked me before the poll started, James, when are you going to contribute? And. And I'm not saying that, that I didn't contribute with, with the Pogues or anything, but I think he was waiting for a book to happen by way of contribution. So it was kind of for him. Did he get the, was he still around for you to see the book? No, he died. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm. All right, let's go into the fourth track on the record. I'm a man you don't meet every day. Uh, Peter, play the first verse. Well, my name is Joke Stewart. I'm a canny gun
so the first thing I thought was, Jesus, Shane has vocal range. <laughs> then I realized it was sung by the female bassist. Say her name again. Cot. Cot O. O Reardon. O Reardon. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great song. Uh, just a traditional Scottish yeah. song about a bragging fella in a bar with some artistically revised lyrics, but not a change of gender, even though it's sung by a woman, which is something that I loved mm. uh, personally about it. So during the making of this record, mm. uh, Cot and producer Elvis Costello started a relationship. She left the band shortly after, and then they were married from 86 to 2002. Was there any tension in the band after her and Elvis got together? No, I can't say that the... The there was. I think it was it was a bit weird when Cot left because we were rehearsing for I don't know what, if it was for we were rehearsing for live or, or for another album. This is in nineteen eighty seven and uh and as we left at the end of one day of rehearsals, uh we looked around and, and Cot's bass and bass um uh, case were both gone. And we sort of looked at one another like, Well, she never practices, so where's the bass gone? And then next thing you know, she's in fucking San Francisco with, uh, Elvis. with Elvis. So I rang up um, to the ho- to the hotel, um, got um, Elvis on the phone, and and she put and he put me onto car, <laughs> and I said, um, you, "You're supposed to be rehearsing for you know." But then she just said, "Oh, James." <laughs> As if I should have just picked up. Oh wow! So I, oh, I was yeah, I was a, I was a bit dim. Okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> You're like, uh, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> like I thought I was going to like I was going to wrap knuckles here, saying, "Yeah, well, you better be at rehearsal uh, no, tomorrow, uh, even if so, you're in San Francisco." So then I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> oh, San Francisco. All right. So I'll see you the next day. <laughs> and not that either. Oh, okay. So we'll see you in a week. It's on a little. You're on a holiday. Okay. Never. You're never coming back. I should have known. All right. Pair of brown eyes. Now this was the first single, and uh, also it was the band's first song to chart. It reached number 72. All right. And you can see why, because it's a fantastic song. Peter, play 250 into the song. I mean, that's just perfect. That's such a beautiful song. Such a beautiful song. Just well, apart every, from the, the parts apart, labeled one yeah, to three and, it, and exactly. you know, the war stories. That's uh, the thing, is that it's a beautiful sounding song. Yeah, well, now, like the old main drag, you know, so you've got exactly. like, the floaty accordion and then it deals with something that's really pretty hor- uh, horrific. To be, to be honest with you, James, yeah. you're the one that's making it gorgeous. Your accordion playing is just, and I'm not just saying this because you're in the room with me, <laughs> but it drag. adds this <laughs> lush sound to it. That takes it, because dude, the song's about a guy in a bar drinking alone because mm. his lady split up with him, uh, and so he's listening to these sad ass songs on the jukebox, uh, and uh, and then an old veteran comes over and tells him about how his horrific experiences in battle, and then how the promise of his own lady's eyes waiting for him got him through. So that's kind of pretty, but it's really still about those these guys drinking. But when he goes home, she's gone. Then. Uh, the guy leaves feeling worse, but starts thinking about how the old vet is still carrying all that anger yeah, about yeah. his ex lady, even after all these years in the war. And he realizes that he has to let go of his past and find another pair of brown eyes. That's a be- that's a great story. It's a great story. You could take that and turn that into like you know an hour an, an hour and thirty yeah, minute could. uh film. Yeah, and I love the lyrics in this song. So here's here's some lyrics I pulled that I really dug. Uh, So drunk to hell, I left the place, sometimes crawling, sometimes walking. A hungry sound came across the breeze, so I gave the walls a talking. I mean, I just... No, it's just genius, though. It's it's genius. I just, I love it. I love it. Uh, A pair of eyes uh, you didn't pass up were your wife, Danielle's, who you married in 1989. Yeah. And after moving to L.A., you stayed in the band for another five years before leaving to spend more time with your growing family. After hearing about how you agreed to be in the Pogues, as long as as it didn't get in the way of your writing, I've noticed a healthy pattern in your life of being able to walk away from music to pursue other things that are important to you. Right? Ooh, that's interesting. You don't think so? When no, no, no. I do. No, but I never looked at it that in 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 that way. But yeah, maybe. Well, well. When did you first start taking the Pogues seriously? Like, when in your life did you do that? You know. Well, I think. I'd like to say from the from from the the very start, 
except with the proviso that if it was going to get in the way of my <laughs> writing, that was, I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I didn't trust Shane uh, at that time completely, and uh, that that it's you know, like, and I've I'd been in bands that never lasted before, so I didn't trust that kind of. Sure, it's t- being in a well. band is everybody's got to be on board. You know, it's it's tough. It is tough. Uh, it's really yeah. tough. Everybody has to be able to give up everything to get the goal of yeah. making it because it, that's harder than making it as an actor. You know what I mean? Because you have, because there's more than one person. There's more than one person. I was yeah. in a band and 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 three of us were in, and the other guy who was I wrote the songs with, he just wanted to mm. have a family, and then that was it. Yeah. Once he got once he was going, it was over. And it's funny because like the Pogues weren't young boys when 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 the band started. Now I was 28. I, I recently met a guy at a party who who who, who said, uh, "Oh, I've just lost my job, and 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 I don't know what I'm going to do next, and everything seems hopeless." So I said, "How old to get?" And he said, "I'm 28." And I nearly, well, I've, well, I've laughed in his face because it's never too fucking. No, late. it's not. Actually, in this day and age, I, I feel like most people don't have their their shit together until they're 40. I mean, I started at 28. That's mm. when I really oh, started. Yeah. I didn't start getting success, like real success, until I was 37, 30, yeah, 36, so 37. Much the same so, you, yeah, me, you yeah. have to work. So, all right, so, so I get that from taking the poke seriously. When did you realize that you could walk away from it? That was when, when I had my first daughter, Martha. She was born in uh, February 1993. And I stayed with the Pogues for the rest of that year. I invited Jem Finer, the banjo player, out to breakfast to have my notice in six months before I was going to leave. Yeah. (laughs) Which was, you know, in in my head, I was being decent. But another perspective could be like, it's going to take you six months to find an accordion player like me. (laughs) And it could have gone that way. And as it turned out, that the Pogues waited until the last fucking minute before they replaced me with somebody else who wasn't really an accordion player. So I don't know what all that means. Sure. Um, but uh, uh, Daryl, the bass player, was who replaced Cot after she'd walked out in 1987, um, he he was a bit cross that I was leaving. I think Andrew, might, the drummer, might have been a bit cross as well. Jem uh, is just fine and pragmatic with uh, everything. Shane, don't give a fuck, as I said. Um, I don't know if Spider was 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 cross uh, that I was leaving, but uh, I I wanted to be a dad. Good, yeah. good. All right, that goes into uh, the next song. <clears throat> this next one's kind of fun, and it's uh, also as sad as the movie Sophie's Choice. It is uh, Sally McLennan. Did I get that right? No, actually, it's Sally McLennan. McLennan. None. There you go. None. 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 No, none. Well, <laughs> McLennan. McLennan. Mac- you would say it that Mac-Lenan. way. McLennan. No, no, no. Mac- McLennan. McLennan. No, no. You're doing this on purpose. No, I'm not. You are. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> okay. But it's kind of fun, though. Let's be honest. We're no, it a, is. We're going we're having and, a and I can't, I'm trying to figure it out if, if you're just taking the piss. Or... No, I'm, I'm taking a piss, but it's only a tinkle. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is the second <laughs> single. And this one went to number 54 on the charts. All right. Uh, the Sally in the title is a type of stout beer. <gasps> and yeah. I did not know that. Really? And it, well, guess what? We're going to hear more because this song is fun as fuck. Uh, play the final chorus, Peter. I'm sad to say I must be on my way. So buy me beer and whiskey because I'm going far away. I'd like to think I'll be returning when I can to the great estate of Boozer and to Sally McLennan. So. This song is about death and Irish funerals, which are known for celebrating and drinking because they believe we'll all meet again. And in this story, it's a story of a musician who decides to leave his small town for bigger things. But upon his return, he finds out how basically all of his old crew have died. So he drinks himself to death. Uh, I mean, this kind of hits close to home, uh, kind of, because we've all known people like that. But once again, it's all good because we'll meet again but he did have to drink himself until he choked, which sucks. That sounds like a horrible way to die. Uh, So after leaving the Pogues in 1993, you returned for those reunion shows in 2001. Yes. Did did anything change besides everything? Like, yeah, like everything seemed to have changed in, in the, in the meantime, apart from, you know, I'd kept in touch with Jem, particularly he was my best man at my wedding and always been sort of close with, uh, with him. Uh, solidly close. Um, we've had our disagreements and stuff, as you do. Um, and as I've been close with like um, uh, uh, every, everybody in the band, really. It was a shock 
to see Shane after such a long time because uh, he changed such a lot. Um, he's got teeth now. He's have got have teeth. you seen him since the teeth? I, ha- I'm, I haven't seen, been in the same room as him, no. Um, but I've, I saw him on the uh, the Late Late I'm, Show uh, uh, the other night on uh, in Ireland. They had a sort of um, a Christmas show that was de- dedicated... Well, the, the latter half was dedicated to Shane um, and his songs and, and work and everything. Um and he looks uh, uh, a little bit sort of, um, uh, uh, on the Late Late Show, he looked a bit sort of detached, more than I remember him being detached. Um, what do you d- mean, just not? Like dreamy and, sure. and um, uh, kind of distractible. But I've seen those distractible looks on his face before when sort of something looks like it annoys him and he'll just look over at it. You know, do you ever see the Ginger Baker um, documentary? I haven't, no. Um Shane reminded me of, uh, or Ginger Baker reminded me of Shane uh, a little bit. It's like smokers sitting on a, on a lounger, Barker lounger or something, and just giving out about shit. Um, there's something uh, sort of uh, comparable between the two of them. Sure. So when you guys played that reunion show hmm. and you guys started working together again, did, did, was it just like old times? Or um, when you, when kind of, so, but with a, but with a, a, a layer of, of like, oh my God, we're all still alive. Yeah. On top of it, yeah, and so I could go round to look at Philip, who's died in the in the interim, unfortunately. Um, so to from Philip and Terry, and and uh, Terry had uh, difficulties with alcohol. Spider had difficulties with alcohol, um, and he's in recovery. Uh, Philip was in recovery from alcohol. Phil, uh, Terry's the same. Um, Shane w- w- was, you know, uh, is in a, a, a law unto himself. Um, and just looking round, um, uh, I was just so great. To, uh, it was particularly just when I was on the on the piano doing something when I could get a bird's eye view sort of thing from yeah. um, uh, from my perch uh, to have a look at everybody and and just so thankful that these guys were still around and the music that we played um, I guess maybe the technology of of no no it was the same it was it, it the same attitude uh, the same arrangements the same. Uh, 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 energy, um, the same projection, um, the same attitude. I've said the attitude already. Yeah, um, was was really really rewarding that we weren't trying to do any fucking thing else with it or try and play a new load of songs from a new album. It was just like you know, just you know, lifting the needle and put it back on the record. Oh, again. I love that. No, it's fucking I, amazing. That is great. All right, moving on to. Uh, Dirty Old Town. Now, you remember when I said a few songs ago that that one was my favorite? I lied. Peter played 246 at Dirty Old Town. I'll chop you down Like an old Dutch ring Dirty Old Town This was written by Scottish folk singer uh, Ewan uh, McCall. Yeah. uh, And it was made famous by the Dubliners. Yes, it's a song written about Salford in Manchester. Salford used to be just back-to-back terraced houses, lots of smoke, lots of brick, lots of alleyways, lots of um, kind of hive living um, and and um, and difficult, close, um, unsanitary sort of conditions by today's standards. Sure. Um, and and this is a song about um about what a, there's a beauty to it but it needs to go um basically well yeah so that's what i got from it was that they the people that live there they, they take pride in mm-hmm. the fact that they survived living there it's almost like a yeah, badge maybe. of honor yeah um i i thought it's incredible i i, I just love this song this 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 is this is one of those those songs that when it came on this is one like this song, mm. "Dirty Old Town." I can listen to this whenever. Yeah, like I can't listen right. to a cacau- what is it, the fr- the opening song. I know I'm going to butcher the name again. Um, uh, no, you didn't butcher it. You said you did it really well because well, he time. wrote it phonetically for me. Kukulnik, fuck, Kukulin. Thank you, but you see, yeah. that's something that like that that really brings up emotion. I want to speed. Yeah. I want to drive fast. This is something that like I have to drive to Ontario after this. Like I'll put this on and. And oh, and, right. it, and, it, yeah. and it gets into your soul, and, and then and so so does a lot of the few songs that are coming up on this record. I mean, after that song, you have Jesse James, uh, and at first, like I liked this song. Uh, at first, it's, at, at first because I, I well, this is what I wrote when I when I made my my final pass of this. I said at first I was like it's good, but it kind of sounded a little like more of the same. 
It wasn't like every song had a different vibe to it, but this mm. sounded like something that had come up previous. But then the chorus kicked in and I was feeling it. Peter, play the chorus for me. Just It's a take on the traditional 19th century American like yeah. folk song. It's about the killing of the outlaw of Jesse James. It's sung by a tin whistle player, Spider yeah. Stacy. But it, it's just, it, it just, that chorus came in and I was, and I was just hooked. And then I also thought it was so dope that they, that, uh, you know, I know that how many members are there in this band, but that they have a tin whistle player. You know, it's, it's so great. <laughs> it's such a weird <laughs> instrument. It's like, all right, who's on Jug tonight? Well, Frank, no, then, you then on jug? Also, Spider uh, was was um, uh, became well known for for the beer tray instrument, where you would bust your head with a beer tray. Great song. Um, I, I really loved that. Um, I could do without all the pistol shooting and stuff in that. I've got a bit sort of cartoony to me, for um, sure. But but yeah. there's but it's still just a fun song. So yeah. you, you look past it. All right, <laughs> Navigator. Uh, this is another beautiful song. Oh yeah. Uh, it's a tribute to the unskilled laborers uh, who were called navigators or navvies in the English slang that toiled and often died while bidding, building the British railway system. Uh, I think it's beautiful. A canal system too. I think they were called navvies for the canal system because I do. Th- uh, is it? Th- Okay, I can't remember, but I think it's about the canal uh, uh, building rather than the railway building for this particular song. I'm not entirely sure. Well, you well, can talk to me while I well, look what at the I love. These are the lyrics that I picked out. Yeah, of the canals, part. the canals so, are bridges. So, back so what I what I loved about it is like this is this is sample lyrics. They died in their hundreds with no sign to mark where, save the brass in the pocket of the entrepreneur. Uh, by landslide and rock blast, they buried so deep that in death, if not life. They'll have peace while they sleep. I, I mean, that is yeah, it's cool. that is really cool lyrics. What was the hardest uh, and worst job you ever had? Oh, working in a club in Charing Cross Road, refurbishing it with these, actually, funnily enough, with uh, uh, Irish uh, uh, construction workers. And one of my jobs was to climb into the, um, the air conditioning duct to scrape it with a, a paint scraper to get rid of all the soot that was inside it. And I just had a handkerchief around my face oh. to protect myself from the um, the, the particles. Yeah. Um, you get like black lung doing that, right? You can get black lung doing that, but that's like Victorian style. That's fucking real. That's, that yeah, but it's yeah. kind of like black lung's like a badge of honor, right? <laughs> <laughs> was that, is that a bl- I was gonna. Say, I thought you were laughing, and I was like, "Ooh, no. sounds like you got black lung." <laughs> Jesus, James. Oh God, how old were you when you had that job? Sorry, what? How old were you when you had that job? Uh, um, you're like, um, you're like I'm still doing it right now. I was like, yeah. I'm on break. I'm yeah, on break right now. Yeah, can we wind this up? Can we wind this up? I got um, no. Uh, so uh, that was so uh, 26 or 27. Years ago, I was living with Shane and Jem in this uh, 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 sort of legalized squat in in King's Cross. Um, just uh, after the nips had f- finished, I think. Um, I think so. I was, I was still living in that that place. Um, so yeah, I'd be um, I'd be twenty twenty six, twenty seven doing wow. that. Wow. Yeah. All right. I want to uh, not to not to not give these next two songs mm. respect. Uh, Billy Bones is fantastic. Uh, I, I I loved it. I love the way he's when I heard him say the word shite. I love anytime I hear a British guy or a Scottish or an Irish guy say shite instead of shit. It's great. And then the Gentleman Soldier is a fantastic song. It's another traditional English song that they've that's been pogued up. If we want to call it that, a traditional Irish. I, I would say the Gentleman Soldier is it. I don't know if it's Irish or English. I, I'm oh, I'm maybe. sorry. A traditional English song. You're right. No, you're right. It was it was. Uh, it, but it's a fantastic song. But then the the album ends uh, with and the band played waltzing matilda uh and this is a sad personal tale of an old australian veteran who'd lost both his legs and has become one of australia's most important songs it was written in 1971 by eric bogle a scottish folk singer who moved to australia when he was 25 although it's an anti-vietnam war protest song it's about the battle of gallipoli a peninsula on the mediterranean coast of turkey during world war one yeah. Yeah. Australia and New Zealand's militaries allied themselves with Britain, France, and Russia against the Ottoman Empire. But this campaign on Gal- I mean, Gall- G- Gallipoli. Gallipoli. Fuck. Yeah. This is a hard album to talk through. <laughs> that was conceived by a young, up and coming Winston Churchill, led to months of fighting and ultimately a tremendous, bloody defeat. 
um, the neglected and discarded casualties of the war who did the government's dirty work are really summed up while the older soldier is sitting on his porch watching a parade of veterans. Now, uh, Peter, I want you to play uh, six minutes and 36 seconds into the into the song. Play that for me. My city, old men, all twisted and torn. The forgotten heroes of a forgotten war. I mean... Oh, I know, and it's such a, a fantastic round off of an album yeah. that is full of uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the themes of war and 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 dismemberment and um, I I don't know. Uh, could you say patriotism here? I'm not no sure. Idea. No, I think you can. I think you, I mean it's it was a it was a it was a tragic thing that happened, and but I think hearing those lyrics of just talking about the old men march slowly and and the forgotten heroes of forgotten war and I wish harks back to a, a song like pair of brown eyes as well you know those guys experiences in the war too yeah and then the the lighter side of, of well it's not light at all but no. the gentleman soldier about being knocked up in a sentry box um uh, wrapped up in a soldier's cloak and and all that kind of stuff. This uh, is is interwoven. This stuff is with heroes in it, with a sick bit of Cullen and and exactly. Yeah. And this is and this is also the longest song. I mean, and it's like it takes you through this journey. So by the end of it, it's ending on this very like peaceful, like like we said, it's 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 giving you the the real no filler, not not trying to sugarcoat it about what was the way these people felt, but. It's once again this this beautiful send off of of an album that that I feel is just is perfect. I think this is a perfect record, and I think this is the the best song they could have chosen to close oh, the album out. Thanks very with. much. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do some facts, and we'll get you out of here? Sure. The facts and the facts <laughs> and the facts, the facts. All right. Singer Shane McGowan's unreliability due to his drinking and substance abuse forced the band to fire him in 1991. Vocal duties on tour for most of that year were handled by Joe Strummer from The Clash. Wow. Yeah, that was... Um, were, you already, were you still there for that? Oh, yes. Yeah, I so, was, yeah I was, I've, I've been there from, well, from day one or two or a half or whatever, right the way through. The only thing that I ever missed was was one video shoot that we did for uh, one of the singles, and I, I have, I think, uh, an in, uninterrupted uh, attendance record for, for me, and nobody else in the band can say that. Wow. I'm just going to say that myself because I feel like it. Oh, here you go. Like, I'm Lord Snooty. I'm just, I'm just that's, a that's, big fucking swat, dude, really, is what I am. Was there a vote, or did all of you just kind of look at each other and know? All right, so this this is the, the my opening chapter for my for my the memoir. Here comes everybody. I get the book, everybody. Can they get it on Amazon? Is Probably, yeah, yeah. Get it on yeah. Amazon. So yeah. we 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 we've had enough, basically, and uh, we had a meeting in Jem's room in in a hotel in Yokohama, and then uh, we had to draw straws as to who was going to Tell ring him. Shane up to say come down to the um, to the room, and it was Daryl who was the nicest of guys had to do it so he rang up Shane and Shane came down and he sat on a chair and when he said well we've been thinking Shane and Shane said what took you so long wow yeah and that's the end of the first chapter of, of the book and basically the book is telling you know why is it that it took so long for us to let oh, I go. like that. It's all non-linear. Yeah. Look at you, Quentin Tarantino. Oh, I, I mean, yeah. you're playing Pulp Fiction, the Irish Pulp Fiction. Over no, it here. just starts at the end and then goes back to the beginning and goes up to the end again. So, so he, that's... so he took it well then, in in a sense. Um, yeah, he did. There's a lot of grace about him, um, which you never fell from. To refer to the um, next sure. album that we did. Um, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a fucking hell of a guy, really. Yeah. Um. But it was difficult to communicate for him, despite the communications that he can obviously do in, in writing lyrics. He can speak to all hearts, uh, well, most hearts, a lot of hearts, that people understand what he's going on about. But he had a big difficulty in letting us know that that um, he was screwing himself up and screwing the the project, up, sure. if you can call it. No, that. I can imagine. Yeah, I it's hard, imagine. really hard for all of us. I, I can imagine. All right, uh, the cover of the album is based on the Romantic era shipwreck painting, "The Raft of the Medusa" by Theodore Jericho, but with the band's faces painted in. And in your story, there are familiar faces that keep making their way into the picture. After you left the Pogues, you founded the Spaghetti Western band, the Low and Sweet Orchestra, with Xander Schloss 
and this from the Circle Jerks, Mike Mart from Thelonious Monster, and brothers Kieran and Dermot Mulrooney. And I'm yes, people at Fleece Army, Cadougals out there, we're talking about the same Dermot Mulrooney from all those rom coms that you saw in fucking you know the '90s and the 2000s and the 2010s. He was in Point of No Return. I love that movie, and he also starred with your wife. In the 1994 Tom DeKillo movie, Living in Oblivion. It's such a fantastic film, which, by the way, I was also Peter Dinklage's yes. debut. Uh, so now, final question. If you could go back and talk to that young writer from Manchester, would he believe that you'd be living this life? N- uh, no, in, in, in short. But lately, with the group that I'm in, I've been put, I've put together now with Ted Hort and, and, and Mark Oral and everything, um, I sing, and I was never allowed to sing. Oh, not allowed. I never stepped up to sing in the Pogues, uh, except when Shane wanted me to sing the Green Green Grass of Home. We were all going to share vocals, like lead vocals on songs. Jem got um, um, me and Bobby McGee. Um, Cot did All Tomorrow's Parties. Um, Spider, Jesse James. And mine was the Green Green Grass of Home. And I stepped up to the microphone at, um, at a sound check. And as soon as my mouth opened, Shane came across going, no, 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 no. So I never got to sing ever again. So I'm the lead singer, front guy out of Walker Roaders now with Ted and Mark. And here's a, 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 Quentin, a, 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 a Quentin Tarantino sort of back to when I was 10. Yeah. When I was a choir boy at my primary school and in the church choir and, and a more beautiful voice you could not come across basically you? <laughs> yeah i was i was a boy treble and and i managed to do the solo at the at the beginning of once in royal david city which is a big thing in england you do it to you do a verse by yourself you get a note from the the choir master then you've got a verse by yourself the choir comes in follows you and then the orchestra comes in after that so if you've gone off pitch you're fucked. Sure. So uh, I did that two years in a in a row. And if my ten year old boy, f- me version of me, uh, f- happened to find out what his voice was going to turn into, he would have stopped right there and then. <laughs> I love it. All right, James. Final thoughts on uh, rum sodomy and the lash. Um. Hard uh, to come up with final thoughts since it seems to be so kind of relevant nowadays. Yeah. Still, do you know, with the with the war stuff in it, and uh, and um, you know, and and uh, as we were talking about homelessness and the old main drag and stuff, it's still it's still fairly plugged in um, yeah. now uh, and relevant. Um, awfully proud to have done it and awfully proud to have taken it out on the road a couple of years ago uh, before the, the the end of the reunion phase where we did did the the, the, the album in its entirety um, and then had a short break and then did, did loads of other songs but we did it from you know uh, first track to last track uh, in a live sort of setting which was um, fun to do yeah well uh, hard I wouldn't say fun but it, it's it's great man I, I I can't agree with you more uh, this album connected with me on so many levels. No, I'm and glad. I, I am. I am just. I feel honored that uh, my friend Joe Seb put us in touch, and I got to sit down and talk to you. Cool. Oh, no, it was really, really a pleasure to meet you. Dude, as well. so much fun. Thank you for coming on, brother. A true legend on the podcast, guys, the one and only James Fernley. You can find James on Twitter at James underscore Fernley and check out his book, Here Comes Everybody, The Story of the Pogues. You can get that on Amazon or anywhere you get your books. And also check out his new band, The Walker Rotors at walkerrotors.com. Please subscribe on Spotify or your favorite platform where you listen to podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Now, we just listened to the Pogues album Rum Sodomy and the Lash from 1985. 
For new music this week, our musical director, Maddie Pinfield, Lil Maddie Pinfield, selected Inhaler. Inhaler are an up-and-coming five-piece fronted by Elijah Hewson, son of U2's Bono. This band of young Dubliners have been able to avoid simply riding the coattails of their frontman's famous father and are actually proving themselves to be true contenders, as well as a great live outfit. Eli has the gift and swagger of his dad's stage presence and voice, and these melodic synth-infused pop riffs will leave you pleasantly surprised. Listen to their new track, My Honest Face. We got it on Spotify. And check out the link on our website, the500podcast.com. And if you are in a band and were directly influenced by one of these albums or artists and you want your music featured on the 500 website, send your song to 500 podcast at gmail.com and make sure you put the album and artists and influence you in the subject line next week is Sam Cook week with his album live at the Harlem Square Club 1963 this album might have changed my life and this episode coming up might change yours look to the stars everybody do your homework Listen to their album on Spotify. Kadoogly doogly, stay fleecy, cuz spoogly.